So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, enjoying, for joining us for the Ideas Seminar. The Ideas, Sem Ideas is CMU Center for Disinformation, Hate Speech, Extremism Online. This summer, we will be offering a Summer Institute, which you're welcome to sign up for, as well as a conference. We hope that you will be able to join us for those two great events. Today, however, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Our speaker is Yu Ru Lin, who is a professor at the School of Computing and Information, the University of Pittsburgh. She will be talking to us about linking online attention to offline actions, which is a key and critical issue, I think, to all of us these days and something that has gotten increasing play recent, due to recent events. At the, um, at the University of uh, Pittsburgh, where she is, she directs the Pitt Computational Social Dynamics Lab called PISCO Lab. And she does research at, at, uh, in com computational social science, data mining, and visualization. She specializes in using social network and text data along with statistical learning tools and social theories to study phenomena spanning societal events, policy, um, anomalous behaviors, and so on, looking at complex uh, patterns in the real world, particularly those that arise in response to real world societal risks. Her work has appeared in a number of uh, scientific venues and has also been cited by places like the Boston Globe, the Atlantic, MIT News, and NPR. She's authored more than 100 referee journals and conference papers, served on many program committees. She actually was inaugurated the Graduate Student Consortium as part of the SBP BRIMS conference and so on. She's also been associated with um, WWW and ICWSM. She was selected as a fellow of the Cavley Frontiers of Science, uh, the National Academy of Science, and her research has received funding from various places including Amazon and Adobe and various places like NSF DARPA and AFLSR. I'm delighted to have her speaking to us today. You will good, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. And thank you, uh, Kathleen, for inviting me uh, to share my work here. And thank you for your warm uh, introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to share my recent works on linking online attention to offline actions. This is part of my project uh, funded by Air Force and DARPA and some of this is still ongoing. So I will appreciate to hear your thoughts and feedback on this. So for today's work, um, today's talk, I'll begin with a short introduction to the research my group and I have been doing, and I will present three works under the theme of online attention and offline action. I'm a computer uh, scientist, by training, uh, but my core interest is in exploring uh, social phenomena. More concretely, uh, I'm interested in developing computational and statistical approaches for studying uh, social phenomena. So the question that motivates my research is, how might we uh, empirically study the social world, given that almost all social systems are inherently multivarious, complex, and evolving over time and space? By social systems, I mean uh, individuals interacting directly or indirectly with each other according to shared cultural norms, meanings, and artifacts. Often we are so embedded in the social world we live in without knowing the system uh, itself. So how do we uncover the meanings from the interrelations of individuals with their social environments? So this is the key questions that uh, I would love to ask. So I'm consider myself as a computational social scientist. Uh, my approach has been leveraging, uh, in leveraging methods in network science, data mining, and data visualization. My students and I have been uh, envisioned uh, to use data, big data or small data, uh, to work on something more meaningful uh, to our society. And the data can be as big as covering the global population, or as small as covering uh, several years of individuals. And we focus on modeling and analyzing patterns of change within a social system. 
So today uh, we see uh, social media has been a big part in politics and social changes. We have been analyzing online political discourse since uh, 2010. Our analysis around the 2012 uh, presidential election is one uh, among the first uh, studies that describe how uh, political talks triggered by societal media events have distinct properties to drive attention from normal uh, political communications. And we also have work on texts as social data, mine from uh, social media. We've done several studies on examining uh, the online offline interactions. For example, uh, our studies on uh, disasters such as Boston bombings and Paris attacks have shown how uh, social and emotional responses under shocks have distinct characteristics. So in the past few years, we have focused much on understanding human with the social systems and artifacts, uh, such as the structure of networking, the structure of social and emotional responses and the structure of communications. With the hope that understanding more about our social systems can help us cope with the crisis and mitigate the risk. But recently we realized that that there are more risk produced by the innovation of the system itself, particularly in uh, big data science and uh, social technology. So I begin to ask ourselves how to understand and mitigate such risk. This is not about distinguish bad guys from the good guys. This is more about how ourselves may be involved in producing risk. So I would like to mention a stream of my research on this, although this is not today's focus. So this is about the biases produced in machine learning and AI that contribute to making harmful data-driven decisions. And we ask, can we build machine to reveal, meet, uh, and reveal and mitigate biases? So in our group, we build machine to teach human how to mitigate biases from machines uh, to mitigate uh, harm or uh, discrimination. And we build machine to be conscientious about group profiling. Uh, this is to mitigate harm of stereotyping and uh, discrimination. And we have worked on uh, detecting and mitigating the ideological biases uh, from language models. So here are just some pointers. Uh, in case you are interested in knowing uh, more about our work in this stream. So now I'm going to introduce uh, uh, three studies about the online social threats. So in the first study, we look at the online prejudice and we ask, can we reduce online prejudice? So we consider prejudice as individual's expression of antipathy toward a person or a group. So on the right, uh, you can see examples for, uh, about how prejudice was observed online from two tweets. This tweet expressed dislike, uh, false assumption, and stereotypes toward undocumented uh, immigrants. And the problem of online prejudice has been uh, prevailing. Uh, recent uh, survey shows over health of Americans experience online hate and the prejudice. And the experience is more severe in minority groups. So can online prejudice be reduced? To address this problem, a larger societal change uh, needs to be happen, needs to happen. So there has been online regulation put in place. Uh, social media companies try to develop automated techniques to identify online prejudice acts and hate speech. But still, minority groups have continued to be the primary targets of uh, various forms of prejudice in social media. Another strategy is through intervention. There has been ongoing social movement and protest. They seek to increase awareness and change people's attitude, but the results are unclear. Some studies found protests can suppress prejudice. Uh, others found protest has no effect 
or even negative effect on prejudice? And what about the effect of protest on online prejudice? So our work is the first to look at the relationship between offline protest and online prejudice. In this work, we asked how did protest increase awareness of immigration issues and how did it reduce online prejudice? If change did happen, what kind of users were more likely to change and in what way they change? So the challenge for studying uh, a change is that you need to estimate the best rate. That is how people normally say about a topic in order to assess the change. So to address this, uh, we come up with a study design uh, to construct focus user panel around these focal events. So we chose uh, two national nationwide protests in the US. Uh, back in uh, 2017, the Trump administration in at several discriminatory bans on immigration groups and the anti-immigrants and anti-Muslim narratives populated at that time. These protests were organized to call for stopping prejudice against immigrants. So this includes Stay Without Immigrants and No Ban No Wars. So these are the protests in 2007 and early 2018. So center on this two uh, large protests, we construct online focus group. Uh, these are stratified samples of Twitter users from different locations. The stratification uh, is based on users' geographical exposure. For example, number of protests taking place in users' city. And this allows us to compare users' pre and post event behaviors. So in total, we collect 100, uh, over 102,000 Twitter users, amounting to uh, over 30 million tweets covering the event. And in order to compare their behavioral response, response uh, we need to measure prejudice. So based on the prejudice definition, we develop a two-step de uh, detection methods to detect prejudice. So I'm going to skip the technical details, but the key points is that we were able to detect prejudice uh, using a classifier trend on human coded data. And the classifier works pretty well. So what have we found? So here you can see two plots, one for each protest. On the y-axis, I plot uh I plot the average uh sorry, on the y-axis, I plot the average percent relevance tweets from users. This is uh, as a measure of awareness. And on the x-axis, uh, we distinguish the before and after protest mm -hmm. as the treatment effect. And the users live in different cities. Some have a large protest and some have a small, uh, small size protest. So in this way, users are exposed in different intense intense label of protests. So based on their location, we can consider users receive different uh, exposures. And by comparing users across exposure labels, we found that users measure awareness of immigra immigration issues significantly increase after a protest, and in particular for the high exposure group. So the protest reduced online prejudice. We again compare the treatment effect uh, before versus after uh, and in different uh, exposure uh, labels. And users are not equal. Uh, some users have never been observed with prejudice behavior. And so here we need to examine uh, these uh, behavior separately. So we separate users uh, by precondition and once we separate users into prejudice and non-prejudice groups, we found that the major prejudice of prejudice users significantly dropped after protest by over 50%. And then we further look at the types of changes. So using theme coding, uh, we are able to identify four different major things. 
So this is an example of one of the things, attacking prejudice suppressors. So this is an example tweet, uh, examples. It shows tweets posted by the same users before and after the protest. Before the protest, the user tweeted, all illegals should be deported within six months. And after the protest, the user shift the focus and then start attacking the protesters. If you love refugee, refugees so much, you should open your home to them. And we had a number of observations like this in each thing. So this suggests that while users were less likely to express prejudice explicitly, they may still hold the same attitude. The expression become more subtle uh, after the protest and it becomes very tricky uh, because even human may not agree upon whether or to what extent it's a, this is a prejudice speech. So the major results uh, from this study is that we found offline actions lead to measurable online behavioral change and change did happen, but prejudice attitude had turned into subtle expression. And the change, uh, this study uh, provides a contextual understanding and the typology of change in prejudice expression. And we also offer suggestions on how to more accurately detect prejudice on social media. So in the second study, uh, we are looking at uh, another phrase, the online polarization. And we are trying to understand this from its processes by linking online collective attention across platforms. So we know that uh, social media are becoming powerful tools for marketing uh, political views uh, for better or for worse. For example, campaigners, grassroots uh, activists, and normal citizens use social media to promote their political preferences. And on the other hand, uh, online space uh, seem to, seems to be more and more uh, polarized. It has negative uh, effect, it has negative consequence on our democracy. And existing uh, studies mostly focus on the outcome, such as a uh, polarized picture or virality of content uh, and not from the attention gathering processes. So how did it get polarized? To understand this, we need to know what uh, opposing ideas have been campaigning. Are opposing ideas campaign in the same way or in different way. So we formulate this study into two questions. Uh, what do online information campaigns look like? And how do campaigns differ across political spectrum and relate to content uh, popularity? And how do uh, online campaign activity reflect the offline broader societal atti atti attitudes uh, of the promoted uh, topics. And the underlying question behind these two is, will attention garnered in one online space transcend to another and to offline behaviors and opinions? Uh, we did not attempt to make uh, any causal argument on this. We just tried to look at the correlation because uh, typically correlation is a useful first step uh, for discovering the causal relationship. And even for the correlation, this is largely unknown because we know that there's lots of literature on quantifying political act activities online, but most of the measurements are carried out with data and observation from a single platform. And whether the behavior uh, behavior differences of the group surpass a single platform is still an open question. And little is known about the community use and practice, such as those that we know in politics. Uh, further, uh, linking group behavior across multiple online platforms and to offline behavior 
or attitude is not yet uh, fully, uh, not yet clearly explored. So let me show you an example. In this figure, we plot the time series of daily view count uh, for all the Black Lives, Lives Matters videos uh, collected from YouTube. And the time series are disaggregated by video users' political leanings. Blue is the left leaning, red is the red leaning. And I'll describe, describe how we collect and identify this information uh, shortly. So this is just a preview of the phenomena. And visually, YouTube view counts of both left leaning and right leaning videos are relatively stable in the year of 2017. But you see a sharp spike triggered by United the right uh, rally in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Then we plot the daily volume of tweets mentioning all these uh, Black Lives Matter videos uh, from Twitter. And you can see the tweet counts of writing in videos has many spikes due to the uploads of new videos from the YouTubers. And these YouTubers mostly are the far right political commentators. So comparing these two curves, the measurement on YouTube and Twitter show very different stories. If we focus on the two weeks, two weeks period after the rally, left-leaning videos attract more attention on YouTube, but right-leaning videos have high exposure on Twitter. So this example demonstrates the need for cross platform analysis because findings on one platform may not generalizable to another platform. So to answer the questions, we need to connect the data to campaigns. And because there's no readily available data telling you who campaign what. So first we identify the focal campaign issues. In order to find opposing uh, campaigns, the issue need to be controversial, stand alone. Uh, they, they are not part of the larger issue and they need to be diverse, important to the society and better to have uh, international relevant. And they also need to have sufficient uh, online presence. So we focus on issues such as gun control, abortion and anti-racism. And here we focus on the Black Lives Matter movement or, or BLM uh, for short. And the second step is to identify relevant information to the campaign. And we first link the YouTube video uh, uh, to the uh, Twitter platform. This is an example to illustrate how we link the data. This is the video, uh, one of the most uh, treated video on YouTube. And we collect videos that have been decent uh, views and shares on both platforms and track back to the sharing history. So I'll skip uh, the details. And in, in brief, uh, this step results uh, lots of uh, videos. And for, from this, uh, we extract uh, videos and tweets relevant to the political topics. So we select uh, candidate videos with titles and mention tweets containing the relevant keywords. And then we, we, we use a manual and semi-automatic uh, uh, approaches to annotate uh, relevant videos. And our annotation result in very high uh, interrater reliability. The last step, is to identify campaigning group, campaigning uh, group and their network from all the users who we observe to mention the campaigning information. So we first extract the Twitter follower networks of users who share YouTube videos. And we focus on those who were early uh, in the video sharing time and we call them early adopters. We focus on early adopters because they have more pivotal uh, roles uh, in this sharing process. And then we will build networks about uh, uh, two, two kinds of network, uh, share audience networks and follower following, uh, following networks. And then to find the campaigning communities, we will need to identify the leaning, leaning of uh, Twitter users. 
and the leaning information is again uh, not readily available. So how do we uh, discover their leaning? We rely on a few speed users that show explicit leaning information in their profile description. We can label these users based on the hashtag uh, in their profile description. The hashtag like uh, make America great again, or hashtag mega, or hashtag science matters, or hashtag I'm with her, show clear leaning information. So this is uh, not the same as inject hashtag in, in the tweet. This is showing the hashtag on their profile description. So with these seed users, we leverage uh, uh, label propagation. It's a semi-supervised uh, learning uh, approach to infer the leaning uh, for all the users through this uh, shared audience network. And then we can get a continuous leaning scores for uh, all the users on the networks. So this automatic uh, detection works pretty well with the accuracy, accuracy over uh, 97% based on course validation. So now we will infer the video leaning. Uh, this reflects users' campaigning orientation. In other words, campaign for what? So for this, uh, we compute the leaning score for each YouTube video by averaging, uh, aggregating all the promoters' uh, leaning scores. And we want to assign discrete labels, that is left, right, or center, to the videos. Uh, and we we, we uh, assign these labels based on external data set called uh, reflux, uh, reflux, refluence. This data set has a human annotated uh, annotation for over 800 uh, YouTube channels uh, for left, right, and center. So with that uh, human annotated data, uh, that allows us to compute the posterior probability distribution of the leaning scores from our large uh, set of uh, YouTube data. And these are the uh, posterior uh, distribution of videos in the three topics. You can see a clear separation from left to right with the center in the main middle. So using this uh, posterior uh, distribution, we can convert the continuous uh, linear scores to discrete label, uh, left, right, and center, based on this ratio that gives the posterior uh, uh, probability of one label given the linear score equated to the posterior of another label given to the uh, linear score. So in total, uh, we extract hundreds of relevant videos uh, involving hundreds thousands of uh, Twitter users and amounting to hundreds of uh, millions of views. So with this uh, group uh, and leaning this aggregate data, now we are ready to measure the collective attention to understand how they campaign. So in the following, I'm going to show lots of attention metric. I will show for each topic and for different metric and show the two-sided density distribution plot to compare left-leaning uh, versus right-leaning. And the metric will depend on the platform uh, we observe, whether it's YouTube or Twitter. So this shows the video attention uh, on YouTube. Uh, from the left to right, you see the number of views in the first uh, 120 days, uh, the relative engagement score, this is the percentile ranking of average watch percentage among videos of uh, similar uh, length. And then uh, the right, we have viral potential uh, estimate. This estimates the expected number of views a video will get uh, if mentioned by an average tweet, which I will explain shortly. So all the metrics here show that left-leaning uh, videos receive significantly higher engagement on YouTube. So we use a non-parametric test to test the significance differences. And so this shows how viral uh, potential is calculated. So we consider a tweet as a exogenous stimuli and it triggers or increase the number of views on YouTube. So viral potential estimates the expected number of views a video will get if mentioned 
by an average treat. And we use this uh, hoax uh, uh, intensity process, HIP. Uh, it's a process that have been proposed to link two uh, related time series. And uh, so to capture the total amount of attention generated by one unit of promotion from Twitter, uh, this is basically the integral of the impulse uh, response function. So in addition to the attention and engagement, we also consider the re reaction. The this is based on the distribution of like versus dislike on the YouTube. And here we calculate the ambivalence, hostility and intensity. And in general, we found that left-leaning videos receive significantly more diverse uh, engagement on YouTube. Now let's shift to Twitter. Based on the tweets, retweets, and replies mentioned these uh, videos, uh, we find that uh, right-leaning videos receive significantly higher engagement on Twitter. And the network analysis of the early adopters network show that left-leaning video tend to cascade through central nodes, such as elites or users who can connect to larger audience. But right-leaning videos tend to cascade more from the less centralized promoters. And the temporal metrics over the network shows that right-leaning videos often took more time to propagate. And in terms of how long the video uh, circulated in the network, we found that right-leaning videos tend to circulate longer on Twitter. So while we have seen uh, so far, we found that left-leaning videos receive significantly higher engagement on YouTube. They also receive significantly more diverse engagement. Right-leaning videos receive significantly higher engagement on Twitter. And over the Twitter network, left-leaning videos cascade through central nodes, uh, but uh, right-leaning videos more likely to cascade through uh, less centralized promoters. And the uh, right-leaning videos took uh, more time to propagate, but tend to circulate longer. So this uh, shows a very different picture of campaigning from the two sides. Across the two social media, left-leaning campaign is wider uh, but shallower, but right-leaning campaign is deeper and less longer. And next, we examine the online offline connection. So we, we have uh, collected uh, various uh, offline statistics that related to these three topics. You would think, since the topics are highly contentious, we should have lots of offline data, such as opinion surveys uh, or polls to capture uh, population's attitude. But in reality, there are limited data that are sufficiently representative, sufficiently fine-grained and uh, disaggregated by time and geography. For example, for gun issues, uh, state level uh, gun poll are nearly unavailable. So we use gun ownership as a proxy for statewide attitude for gun. So using all the recently available data, all the data that we can find, uh, we formulate totally nine different uh, prediction tasks. And for online signals, uh, our learning disaggregate data allows us to look at the more complicated uh, campaign activities and tensions between uh, learnings. And from there, we construct a set of online features from both Twitter and YouTube. I'll skip the details uh, for this moment. And now here are the example uh, showing the relationship between the online and offline activities. Uh, we found that the first order correlation among online and offline data suggested, uh, suggests that relationship, this re online offline relationship appear as expected. So let's first look at the plot on the right, um, on the left uh, for the abortion uh, example. So on the X axis, I show the online feature. Uh, this is the pro versus anti intensity, uh, meaning this is the pro legal abortion 
intensity versus anti-legal uh, legal abortion uh, intensity. And on the y-axis, I show the public opinion uh, supporting for legal abortion. And the bubble represents each, each state with size showing the number of online users uh, in our data set. You can see from the scatter plot, the online poor legal abortion versus anti is strongly and positively correlated with the public opinion for legal abortion. And similarly, on the right uh, figure, you can see the online poor gun control versus anti-gun control is strongly and negatively correlated with the gun ownership. So when we incorporate the online uh, activity metrics into the prediction model, we found that models with online activity may, uh, features uh, improve the estimation of all offline support uh, to legal abortion by nearly 50% over the baseline. The baseline includes all available offline uh, historic data. So of course the nine prediction tests we found that online signals achieve up to 50% uh, performance gain uh, in terms of reducing RMSE and increasing uh, out of sample R squared. So out of these nine prediction tasks, three of them are predicting future changes using the, the past data. So the performance scan uh, demonstrate that this is not just correlated the past or current uh, data set, uh, but also we are able to predict the change in the future using the current data. So we decomposed the feature importance in the model in brief. We found that tension uh, features like uh, the pro versus anti tend to have a significant contribution to the prediction models. So let me summarize the key result uh, so far. Uh, this is the first study linking the behavior across multiple online platforms to offline signals. And we found that campaign activity differ by group. Uh, for example, the left-leaning videos are more viewed, uh, more engaging, uh, but less treated. And the right-leaning videos have longer attention spans, more treated, but have less view counts and less watch time. And the diffusion of uh, uh, left-leaning videos depends more on early Twitter adopters with high centra centrality. Uh, these are mostly elite users. Uh, However, the writing in videos depend on the decentralized uh, network of users. And we show how online traces can be used to predict this offline support. So uh, this uh, online campaign reflect this uh, political territory and enable a now casting of uh, population attitude uh, on this uh, contentious issue. And in all the nine prediction tests that we show, including online signals, operable models, uh, uh, that only account for historic offline data set. So now the last in the last study, uh, I want to briefly talk about uh, our study on discovering attitude change from online narratives. So this study focused on the attitude change in the wake of mass shooting. All right. So this is about gun violence. Um, the gun violence and the debate between gun rights versus gun control, this is the most long uh, lasting and contentious issues in the United States. The mass shooting in um, Orlando, uh, Florida uh, nightclub on uh, June 2016, this was the deadliest mass shooting in the modern US history. And sadly, soon after, uh, there's another uh, shooting uh, in October 2017 uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, and this uh, result in uh, uh, at least 58 uh, killed and uh, over 500 uh, were injured. And in 2018, uh, there are Parkland High School shooting and Tree of Life in Pittsburgh. So every mass shooting uh, restarted a divisive debate. The main challenge are not what the right solutions are, 
but people believe completely different right solution. The two opposing sides, people for gun control and people for gun right, they seem to believe in completely different cause, different consequences and different solutions. So we ask, have people's beliefs about gun uh, change across multiple tragic uh, shooting events in recent years? By belief, we focus on the uh, causal or attributional belief, uh, meaning what leads to the tragedy, uh, why and how guns should be regulated and what can be done to prevent it. There have been lots of work uh, studying gun issues, including the divided uh, debate. But this uh, work is the first study that tries to understand the causal or attributional belief from uh, text analysis. So we decided to unpack these questions from social media users, um, everyday conversations. We utilize a large panel of over 155,000 uh, users who we know their ideological preferences. And we collect their complete timeline of tweets over three years. And the data cover a three deadliest mass shooting between 2016 and 2018. Here I show the daily tweet volumes, and these are the tweets mentioning the gun issues from all our uh, panel users, breaking down by conservatives and liberals. And you can see how the tweet volumes peak on the day of mass shooting and then linger for about two weeks, depending on how the events unfold. And in this work, we can combine uh, statistical and qualitative methods uh, for comparison. We use statistical analysis to extract patterns of linguistic uh, features and the narrative uh, qualitative analysis to characterize the narrative uh, structure. So this shows the results of uh, linguistic uh, dynamics. To assess the change, we compare uh, users' uh, warp occurrence rate with the base rate prior to the events. So we use the pre-event time uh, to calculate what's the normal rate a user would treat with a particular linguistic category. And here we use the Luic linguistic uh, lexicon. And we use Poisson rate estimation to quantify the rate of change. So the x-axis here uh, show how much change of a war occurrence rate over the base rate. And the y-axis shows the different uh, linguistic categories. We focus on three things, um, the relevant discussion, the causal reasoning, and the emotional shocks. So these are measured by tweets relevant to uh, gun debate uh, over all users' tweets. And the relevant tweets containing the negative effects, such as sad, anxiety, and anger. And the relevant tweets contains causal uh, connectives, for example, because, less, or uh, the words that suggest cause and effect, for example, result, effect, and reason. So you can see the negative effective, uh, uh, this negative uh, sentiment uh, and the cause words were um, 15 times more uh, and more likely to happen compared to the best rate. And across events and stages, we found that uh, significant uh, linguistic shifts reoccur across events. And most uh, uh, dramatic change was in the immediate uh, 48 hours uh, right after the mass shooting. And interestingly, interestingly uh, the change in both groups appear to be very similar. So what makes the conversation different was not a linguistic feature quantity, but something more uh, behind these features. So to understand this, we use narrative analysis. So because we are interested in the change of narrative in different ideological uh, groups and across different events, across different time. So first we create a stratified uh, samples. We randomly sample a set of tweets from our data set that contains the causal linguistic features. 
And then we stratify by different learning groups, uh, by different events and by different stages. And then we identify the narrative characteristic. We draw upon a literature from policy understanding. It's called Narrative Policy Framework or NPF. So the big idea is that people construct stories they believe to reflect the causality uh, in the event. So NPF decomposes how people construct these stories, specifically by considering the narrative elements, for example, villain, victims, and hero. Uh, and this reveal how the narrator interpret the cause and consequence through their own or others' live, uh, life experience. So more concretely, uh, to understand how users believe or think uh, why the shooting happened, we identify three different attributional elements, including problem nature, blame target, and characters. For example, this tweet suggests the problem nature. This is how the user think the uh, root cause of a recurring problem, the recurring mass shooting. And this tweet suggests the blame, tar blame target. This is how the users think who or what should be blamed in this event or should be responsible for the problem. And this tweet mentions the character uh, because the user suggests the senator and NRA are both villains uh, who made bad things happen again and again. And all the following codings achieve substantial interrelated agreement. So here I show the first set of results. Uh, from the left to right, you will see different stages. Uh, before the event, we seen 48 hours uh, after the mass shooting, we seen the first week and we seen the second week. From top to bottom, you will see different attributional uh, elements. This plot shows the percentage of each attributional elements across different stages. And we see the two ideological camps differ uh, by their causal narratives in response to events and across time. After the shooting, uh, tweets about problem nature and blame target emerge. And this shift were more prominent in conservatives. And then right after the events, the discussion tend to focus on villains and victims, but gradually shift to hero uh, who can bring the solution uh, to the problem. And what kind of solution were discussed? We first compare the user's stance. Stance reflects user's position on the issue, uh, whether they are for control or for gun right. And we found that dominant stance in both, campaign, uh, in both uh, ideological camps. That is in conservative pro-gun right, in liberal, uh, in liberal group pro-gun control. These are the dominant stance. And we found the dominant stance drop significantly uh, by over 27%. And then we identify uh, call to action. This means whether the user call to do something and here I show this figure. In this figure, I show the percentage of call to action across different stages. And we found more call to action after shooting incidents, but the two camps uh, differ by the timing of call to action. Conservatives call to do something right away, but liberal call for action uh, later, later. And what do the users call for? We know most users uh, call to act based on their dominant uh, stance, or uh, the view aligned with their ideological caps. But we also see an uh, interesting counter example, like this tweet that I show here. This shows an example of mixed stance um, and call to action uh, from a conservative group, a convert conservative users. It has a call to action the stance was mixed. It's pro-gun uh, pro right, 
but suggests certain regulation. And we found such mixed stance alternative action costs increase, uh, especially in conservative, and can be observed immediately after the events. So a tweet like this, you see the suggestion was given by rhetorical questions. So this is really interesting. How many different rhetorics are there? So then we identify uh, seven distinct rhetoric schemes. Uh, so for example, uh, this reflect how they, uh, so these different uh, rhetoric uh, screen, uh, schemes reflect how they pursue uh, others about why a stance is valid or invalid, why a suggested a policy solution will work or not, and why a change uh, or call to action is needed. So I'll give uh, some example. For example, the first uh, tweet is a rhetoric scheme, a uh, story of decline. And this suggests that bad things always happen and not change. And this tweet uh, is a argumentative assertion. Um, and this tweet is an evidence-based argumentation. And the final tweet is again, a rhetorical Question. So there are totally seven distinct uh, rhetoric, uh, rhetoric schemes. So here I show when these different uh, rhetorics appear, appear on Twitter. From top to bottom is the different stages uh, during the events. And the X axis distinguish the different uh, rhetoric uh, schemes. And the plot shows the percentage of different rhetoric schemes over time during the events. And you can see the use of schemes change a lot uh, compared to the pre-event uh, baseline. They change from more diverse use of schemes to concentrate on few schemes. Uh, the highlight is that sarcasm uh, was used a lot by conservatives before the events, but after the events, both camps tried to persuade others using argumentative assertion. And the shift between sarcasm and argumentative assertion is an important one. Because we know that sarcasm is typically used to negatively make fun of others for something that you don't, uh, you, you, you disagree. Argumentative assertion may be used without negativity. So such a shift uh, may suggest that the conversation uh, can move away from attacking the opposite side to the one that could be used positively to argue a view or to contrast or compare a distinct uh, views. So combining the narrative and the affect uh, uh, linguistic attribute, we were able to explain why dominant emotion in conservative is anxiety, and why the dominant emotion in liberal is anger. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. The key result in this uh, study is that this is the first uh, study to examine users' narratives that reflect the causal attribution. It reflects how they think, why they think, uh, why they think the mass shooting happened. And how such, uh, we also show how such narratives uh, change across uh, gun violence events. And we found that the same shooting uh, instance mean differently uh, to different ideological camps. The complexity could be uncovered by coupling the stance, the attribution, and the emotion. And over time, the discussion were more assertive than antagonistic. Um, this uh, immediate and short-term shift uh, in narratives after the shooting uh, can point out a certain opportunity uh, to reconcile the group conflicts. And based on our finding about the misstands emerge uh, in the critical time, and we, we, we found that if social media just emphasize the majority opinion or dominant views, such mixed opinion would just flush away. So the implication in this study is that 
social media and ICT, uh, they need to support diverse narratives, especially those beyond existing or dominate uh, framing around contentious issues. So you can engage users uh, in their bubbles, but there are good timing uh, where breaking the bubble won't increase the conflict, but help people to reconcile the conflicts. And so here are a few uh, things I hope to share uh, through uh, this, uh, through my studies. Um, online prejudice and polarization have different faces and faces. And we show that this contextualized measurement is important uh, to reveal uh, these uh, faces. And I also want to uh, this differentiate the uh, uh, two concepts extrapolation and transformation. So online collective attention can be feasibly extrapolated to offline attitude. Online, uh, online uh, attention, attention and tension uh, reflect the political territory. And our study, although it cannot show the causal link, uh, it contributes to now casting of this uh, offline uh, popular, uh, public attitude. And we show how visible this can be done. In terms of uh, transformation, these uh, meaningful social change require cross-cutting uh, political discourse. And cross-cutting political discourse require more understanding from narratives. And we need a more fine grain uh, human and machine learning from the narrative rather than simply feed them into a classification task. And this is important uh, for society, uh, societal change to happen. So finally, I want to acknowledge our funding uh, sources uh, to support our research and I am uh, uh, grateful uh, to have my collaborators and students working together on these projects. With that, uh, I want to thank you for your listening and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. So for questions, feel free to just uh, ask your question. Um, and I'm gonna start the ball rolling by, you really, uh, could you answer for your second study where you were doing predictive analysis? I didn't catch exactly what is it that you are predicting? Uh, that's a very good question. So we predict uh, the, the, the key task overall is to predict offline uh, attitude, offline support for the contentious issue. So for example, gun control, whether you are for gun control or opposed gun control, abortion, whether you are for uh, legal abortion or not, for BOM, uh, how much, whether you are uh, supporting uh, BOM or opposing. And we, we collect the offline polls or surveys from uh, all over the place uh, to uh, as this uh, offline attitude. And we are trying to use the online signal to uh, predict or forecast the offline attitude. Thank you. Yuru, can I ask a follow-up question on that? This is Phil. Oh, hi. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, so in those prediction tasks, where was it done by like different states or different locations, or was there a single signal for the whole population level? Like, uh, what was the what was the unit, uh, the population over which you were doing the uh, prediction? Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, we, are, we disaggregate the entire online space by state. This is because the offline data set were constrained by state. So the most uh, fine grand disaggregate uh, attitude data that we can get is statewide. Uh, so the unit is state and we, uh, we are trying to predict uh, with uh, the, the support or um, against in each state. So that means that you geolocated uh, the online data, for example, from Twitter to state, 
to the state level. Exactly, yes. But could it be that there is also the relationship in the other way around that, uh, uh, that you could predict the online reactions based on their, their offline feelings? And I, I understand that in the prediction, you use previous data to predict future data, but you could also swap it. Like it could be that in, a, in, in one state, uh, both online and offline are always higher. In another state, they're always lower. And you could still take uh, earlier data from, let's say, offline to predict later data from online uh, or vice versa. And you would still find uh, a signal because, of course, you have shown that they are strongly correlated. So I'm trying to discern between the correlation which you have shown and the temporal causality. Um, uh, this is a, a, a fantastic question. So we, I mean, initially we were also trying to uh, decompose or try to uh, estimate the causal strength in this relationship. But unfortunately we don't have enough time series for, for us to measure the time, time series. So what we can do is that we uh, include all the historic data set and regress on that and we show the additional prediction, even mm -hmm. the online signal. And so that's the, the best that we can do given the limited representative offline data uh, on these issues. So I think uh, to move this research more, really the offline representative data is very, very important. And this is a crucial for us to understand the causal relationship of online offline uh, link. And you are absolutely, absolutely right. Because in my first study, we show the link is actually offline to online, offline trigger online. And in the second study, we are not saying that the online trigger offline. We're just saying that the disaggregate uh, uh, opinion is important for you to understand how uh, these online campaign are going on and they are different and this shows the political territory online and how they kind of correlate with the entire environment. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another question here that I was sent by email um, and it says, uh, Yuru, thank you for the great talk. Could you inform, uh, tell us about, sorry, I'm having trouble reading. Could you, Talk to us about the policy implications of your studies. Great question. Um, so I think the policy um, um, policy implication um, is clear in these uh, studies. For example, in the first study, we know uh, online protests. Uh, we know the protests actually help. Uh, to reduce online prejudice to a certain amount. But it's also important that the online uh, prejudice can be, can, can be hide, uh, can be hidden uh, in the different forms. So it's important that we are not consider it as a classification task. If we really want to uh, track the, the attitude change, rather than just regulate the explicit, the most obvious forms of prejudice. Uh, so I think uh, in the first study, we look at the different phases of, uh, uh, of uh, online prejudice and how uh, the offline actions like protests can actually change the behavior, but not change the attitude. So this uh, has an important implication on how you try to regulate uh, the behavior and how you try to change it. Regulate behavior and change attitude is a different, uh, is, is, they are different. Um, and for example, the third, uh, in the third study, we show the narrative, uh, the subtle differences in the narrative. And these uh, voices is very important, it's crucial uh, for, further change, for future change, for people to seek um, uh, uh, re reconcile uh, their, their different opinions. But these uh, 
precious, uh, valuable voices uh, may wipe out if the social media uh, only show the most uh, uh, big voice, right? From elites or from the most uh, uh, contrast views. Um, social media, in this uh, study, we feel like social media, when they do this, this is very uh, analogous to the mass media because mass media uh, like to dramatize things that uh, attract people's attention, attract the short-term attention, but this will help with the long-term uh, societal change. And in this study, I'm trying to show that this subtle change is very, very important and it has uh, policy implication in this, in identify how do we develop a better technology to identify these uh, different framing, uh, different voices on social media. Because if without uh, this uh, better uh, technology to identify these voices, nobody will see these voices. Please feel free to just ask your question. Hi, I, I had a question about the, uh, you showed the result that the uh, kind of liberal side was was more centralized and the conservative side was more decentral, uh, decentralized. And I'm wondering, was that aggregated over the whole time period you were looking at? Yes, um, yes, I'm wondering, it's over 18 months. Okay, I'm wondering, did, did you look at or what are your thoughts on on how those centrality metrics might change over the, peer, over the time? Because you show different spikes in activity between the conservative and then liberal kind of sides. And I'm wondering if that's, those spikes are driving those centrality metrics. And so if you, yeah, like, yeah, if that question makes sense. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, this is this is why we want to have this very long-term study. It's over, uh, it's one and a half years uh, and tracking different topics. And this, from this longer period of time and these uh, uh, different topics, we see a very consistent uh, uh, organizational uh, behavior that is different in different um, in, in these different camps. Um, it is possible that perhaps there's also um, rising star like leaders in uh, um, conservative groups that change the dynamic. It's, it's possible like uh, uh, police politicians, um, uh, but in general, we see the attention is driven by more by the uh, decentralized uh, networks. All right. I'm not sure, if, is there another, um, if there's any questions, ask them now, otherwise we'll, we're hitting close to our bewitching hour here. Okay, you I want to thank you again for giving a great talk with lots of food for thought and so on. And uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for uh, organizing this great seminar. <laughs>